Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Let's begin in prayer in the, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Don't keep the Institute to yourself. If you love it, please spread the word. Father Sebastian, Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. It's all yours. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. We're now going to continue our study of Acts and Paul together, which is it's something that most people don't experience. I know the first time I had a course on Paul, we didn't even really look at Acts. And uh, it was a very confusing course, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> but this course is different. You're getting the, the background, the historical background to understand the Pauline epistles. We can't cover all of the Pauline epistles in the short time that my brother and Andy will give to me for something like this. Uh, so we have to uh, pare it down, or to pare it down to uh, the most important parts, and that is first and foremost to really focus on the historical background, and then we can look at examples in the Pauline epistles where we can see these things. And then what you'll notice is that once you've done this very carefully, you can pretty much pick up any of the epistles, read a little bit of their background, when, when Paul wrote it, and you can start to see that Paul's really just saying the same thing over and over to, to uh, this audience versus that audience. Once you understand the historical context of what was going on, his epistles become relatively easy to understand. There are some things in them, as St. Peter says, that are difficult to understand, but I would say the vast majority of what you find in the Pauline epistles, 99% of the content is relatively easy to understand once you understand the historical context. Without the historical context, 99% of what you find in the Pauline epistles is utterly confusing. Or, unfortunately, many, many people might think, it's oh, it's perfectly clear to me, but in the end, they're really not understanding what he's saying. What we're going to look at tonight is the Judaizer heresy. This is something that most people are totally unaware of and is so critical to understand so much of what Paul says in many of his epistles, especially the main subject tonight, his letter to the Galatians and a bit from Romans. So before we get too far along, let's go back into our historical context and remind ourselves of where we were. You recall that we looked at the early stages of the church, its development from Jerusalem. It spread from Jerusalem into Judea. Still everybody in the church, they are all kosher-keeping, law-abiding, uh, circumcised, they're men, Jews. Right? Then the church spreads from Judea into Samaria. Now, for us, as we listen to that, we, many might say, well, okay, Samaritans, what are those? Those are those people the Jews didn't like. Samaritans are the remnants of the northern kingdom that broke away in the Old Testament period during the time of the grandson of David, Rehoboam. So there was that split, the north and the south, on the Mason-Nixon line there. You had Israel in the north, the majority of the tribes up there. In the south, you had Judea. Okay. And that's where we get the idea of the Jews. The word the Jews are those from Judea, the tribe of Judah, that territory uh, in the south. So the northern kingdom, Samaritans, they're called Samaritans because the northern kingdom had a city, Samaria, its capital city. And so it was also called the, the kingdom of Samaria. The Samaritans we see in the New Testament are remnants of, genetically, remnants of those tribes. And they are... Also, a mix of some genetics from some other nations that the Assyrians had brought in and things like that. Those of you who have studied the Old Testament know these things. 
So the Jews didn't like them for a number of reasons, but they were descendants of Abraham, genetically, at least in part. And by the time you get to the first century, they are serious about keeping the Torah. They have their own form of the Torah. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, the five books of Moses that they had, which were slightly some variants there. But 99% of it is identical to the Torah that the Jews had. So they kept the kosher laws, they were circumcised, they kept Pascha, they had all these, they had all the, fe the feasts and everything. All right? So the faith we see spreads into Samaria. We saw it in chapter 8. Remember that? And then the faith moves into the Gentile world. And this is all foreshadowed in that important verse I've mentioned to you before in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Luke lays out for us the development of the gospel and spreading. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So you know that when Samaria is converted, is baptized into the church, many of them at least, not all of them, then the next stage is the Gentiles. All right, so after the council in Acts 15, as you looked at Acts 15, we looked at it together, we saw what is the major theme here, what's going on? What do we do with Gentiles in the church who are baptized but not circumcised and keeping kosher? Do we have to get them to be circumcised and keep kosher? And while that may seem to us to be kind of a silly question, for them it was a serious question, a question that was so important, so influential, that it prevented Gentiles from coming into the church up until the story of Cornelius. And even then, God had to intervene in that situation, right? Notice none of them were in a hurry to get some water. Peter didn't seem to be in a big hurry to preach the whole gospel there. There was a hesitancy at each stage. Then finally they're baptized. They come into the church, and then the question arises, why did you go? And I want you to go look at this to see the issue here. This is Acts chapter, Acts chapter 11, verse 2. When Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men, underline uncircumcised men, and eat with them? Those are the two issues, okay? If you're a Jew living in the city of Alexandria or Rome, or you can't keep all the festal cycles and all. You had to go to Jerusalem to do that. You couldn't offer all the tithes and sacrifices. They did it in other ways. In the law, in the law of Moses, it says, if you can't make it to, to the place where God causes his name to dwell, that is the temple, uh, to bring your tithes, then take whatever you're going to tithe, your, your 10% of your crop, your flock, your in, whatever, and you, you go and throw a big party for your friends and family. You take, the, you take it all, you, you turn it into cash, and then buy a bunch of food and wine, and you just celebrate in the name of Yahweh. You did the same thing as what you would have done in uh, sacrificing that stuff on the altar in, in Jerusalem. More on that in another discussion. So they, they had they would tie, they would they would do something, they would it, but it wasn't what's going on in Jerusalem. These aren't they're not living like the Pharisees were living in Jerusalem. It's very different. The two major things they could do, the, that a Jew could do living in a foreign city, to really set themselves apart from those around them to keep themselves distinct, was one, to make sure that they were circumcised, very different, none of the Gentiles did this, and two, to make sure that they kept kosher. They had a different way of eating. Now, eating is how people, not today necessarily, but in the old world, that's how people communed. They sat down at a table together. You never would have sat down and had a long discussion with someone without having food involved. Food was always part of it. So to, if you can keep somebody from eating what other people eat, then you can keep a distinction. Okay, so that was very important for them. Circumcision, kosher laws, what you do, what you can and cannot eat. Those were what made the Jew distinct among the Gentiles. Very important. Those were, for them, those were the, the images, the symbols the, uh, of the Torah. Okay? All right, with that in mind then, now you can hear what's going on there uh, in chapter 11. We already looked at the other chapters. We looked at chapter 15. And 
the declaration that they do not need to be circumcised and they do not need to keep kosher to be saved. All they need to do is be baptized into Jesus and walk according to the teachings of the disciples, the teachings of Jesus, right? All right, so then, we left off there last week. Now we're going to pick up here in chapter 15 of Acts, chapter 15 of Acts, verse 36, and we're just going to skim here. I just want to highlight a few things for you, and Andy's going to pull up for us uh, the first and second journey, first the map of the first journey. So we can review for a second where Paul went. That's the first journey. Here we see the map here. You look on your the blue arrows there. They left Antioch. They went to Cyprus. Remember, Barnabas and Mark, cousins, were from Cyprus. They were Cypriot Jews. So they went, they went to Cyprus first because I'm sure they were convinced Paul, hey, this is the place to go. We know people there. So they went to Cyprus. They went across the island. And then after evangelizing the, the island, they went north into modern-day Turkey, into Asia Minor. And then they go all the way up north to Antioch. Now, don't confuse that Antioch with the other Antioch we talked about. This is Antioch of Pisidia. All right? So then they went from Antioch to Iconium, to Lystra, to Derbe. And then, because Paul was chased out of each of these cities in a hurry, he was stoned in one of them. He had, to, he had to get out. He had to flee. But then he turned around after things kind of quieted down, and he quietly came back to each of these cities. And as we heard in chapter 14, verse 23, he appointed elders in each one of those places. That is clergy. We talked a bit about that, right? He was not going to leave them without the sacraments. So then he went back and made his way. There's that red line. He makes his way all the way back to Antioch. Now, I want you to look at those cities, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe. Those are important cities we're going to look at now. Now, Andy's going to pull up the second map, and this is the journey we're going to see now. Chapter 15, verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, come, let us return and visit the brethren. I want you to notice this and highlight this. The purpose of Paul's second journey was, according to Paul's own words, to visit the brethren, the Christians, in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, what do you think he's going to do? Well, get in a boat, go to Cyprus, right, like you'd expect. However, change of plans. And Barnabas wanted to take along with him John Mark. Remember John Mark, Mark the Evangelist. Don't confuse with John the Evangelist. And Paul says, no, 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 I got bailed out halfway through the last journey. So we don't know what caused John Mark to leave halfway through the first journey. We don't know all the details. A lot of people make a big deal about this, but there was a disagreement among them. It says a sharp disagreement. And so Paul decides not to go with Barnabas. Barnabas wants to go with Mark. Barnabas and Mark head off to Cyprus on an independent journey. Paul is going to head north out of Antioch and head to those cities again. So look at chapter 16 now. He takes Silas with him, one of the guys who had come from Jerusalem. I'm sorry, chapter 15, verse 41. Chapter 15, verse 41. He went through Syria, Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Stre underline that, strengthening the churches again. He visited the same churches just like he intended to do that he had seen before, okay? Uh, this is really cr critical for what we're going to look at. So make sure you've marked chapter 15, verse 36. Paul's plan was to visit the churches that he had established. Then, because Barnabas and Mark are going to head off to Cyprus, he doesn't need to go to those churches. He's going to let them do that. He's going to deal with the churches of Asia Minor. See how this works? They split it up. It says he goes through Syria. That means he's going to head north out of Antioch into Cilicia and that, and that region, Galatia as well. Chapter 16, and he came also to Derbe and to Lystra. You see those cities, right? To Derbe, to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken by the brethren at Lystra and Iconium. Notice his father is not said to be a, a brother or a Christian, a believer. So, Timothy's mom is a Jew who is a believer. That is, she's a Christian. 
but she lives in this region, in, in Lystra. Lystra, Derbe, this is Greek-speaking territory. Right? This is a Gentile world. And the Jews were, you could find little Jewish communities in every one of these cities. We saw Paul doing that on his journeys, right? And so you have a Jewish woman living in the city, the daughter of, a Jewish, of Jewish parents, who has married a local Gentile, a Greek. Now, don't think, you know, uh, you know a guy from Athens. A, a Gentile. Greek here just means a, a Gentile, non-Jew. She's a believer, though. That is, she's a Christian, and Timothy was as well. We learn later in 2 Timothy that even Timothy's grandmother, the mother of his mother, was also a, a, a Christian as well. But it says his father was a Greek. That is, he was a, a Gentile and, as far as we're concerned, a pagan. He was well spoken of by the brethren at Lystra and Iconium, so he's known in that little region, Lystra, Derbe, Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him. What? After all that? Paul did it? Why? To save him? No. Look what it says. Because of the Jews that were in those places. For they all knew his dad was a Greek. So he had to, he wanted him to be all things to all men. Paul and Silas are Jews, Jewish Christians. They're circumcised. They know the kosher laws. They can move in and out of different areas. They can walk into a, a Jewish home and eat. They can walk into a Gentile home and know what's going on. They speak Greek. They speak Aramaic. They can, they're all things to all men, as Paul says elsewhere. But Timothy would not be able to be all things to all men. They'd have to leave him at the door if they went to, went to a synagogue ruler's house to have dinner or stay overnight. So he has him circumcised so that that way everything's okay. The Jews that he goes to evangelize will not have a stumbling block right, to the, to the gospel. Verse 4, as they went their way, look at this, through the cities, they delivered to them for observance, not for consideration or for, uh, you know, entertainment. No, they, for observance, the decisions which had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So they, as they went to these churches, they went and they delivered to each of these churches the declaration of the council. Now, why would this be important? Because by the time Paul's coming up the second time around, these churches are going to have at least 50%, if not the majority of the believers there would be Gentiles. And this is going to be an issue he's going to have to clarify for them. Make sure they know, don't you try and get these guys to be circumcised to keep kosher, you Jewish Christians, in these communities. And then what happens? So, so the churches were strengthened in the faith. They increased in number daily. All right, there's your first council and the first declaration and proclamation of it. Verse 6, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And it goes on and on and on. So now we're going to hear about him heading off. Andy can bring up that, that second journey now for us. This is his second journey. He's in Antioch. And he heads off from Antioch, and he works his way. As you see, he stops. He goes through Tarsus, probably. That's a guess, but most likely. He'd probably stop and see Mom, have a gefilte fish sandwich or something. And then he goes on from there into Asia Minor, and he goes to Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, and then continues on. From there, he's going to head off into Macedonia. You see him headed from Troas across the Aegean Sea, and he's going to go into Macedonia, eventually down into Greece, Athens, and Corinth. And then he eventually makes his way back to Caesarea and then back up to Antioch. Okay, so that's his second journey in a nutshell. On his second journey, Paul wrote two epistles, first and second Thessalonians. You don't need to worry about those right now. They're relatively easy to understand. There's a few things in them, as Peter says, that some people even today have gotten confused about, but we'll talk about those in another lecture. But the main topic I'll look at with you tonight is this issue of the Judaizer heresy as it manifests in his epistles. So after his second journey, having delivered to those very churches he founded, notice he went to them first. Barnabas and Mark went down to Cyprus, but Paul takes Silas, just like he wanted to, to go to see the churches he had established. Barnabas is going to take the ones in Cyprus. That, they'll take care of that. He's going to head up into Turkey and deal with Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, to strengthen the brethren and to deliver to them for observance the declaration of the council, which was what? 
that any Gentiles who come into the church in Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, they do not need to be circumcised or keep kosher. Very important for the Jewish Christians who are the leaders in these little local churches, right? The, each one of these churches was founded by Paul from a synagogue. And so the first Christians, the elders, the ones he would have ordained as bishops and deacons, these would have all been Jewish Christians. They were in control of the church, but now the churches are being flooded with these Gentiles coming in. Now, they had already been told by Paul, they already knew his teaching, that they didn't need to be circumcised to keep kosher, but Paul makes sure that this, this is clear for them and that the council in Jerusalem declared this. And it says they were strengthened because of that. Okay. Very important. Now then, we're not going to look at the rest of his journey. We don't have time to look at all these examples. Wonderful stuff here. But I want to look at now his third journey, and this is mentioned in chapter 18. After Paul went back to Palestine again, he's going to go on a third journey. A third journey. Chapter 18 of Acts, verse 22. And you can pull up, pull up that second map again for a second. Now, let's look at the map and also in your Bible, chapter 18 of Acts, verse 22. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. Now, if you look on your map there, okay, so they came to Caesarea or Caesarea on the coast. This is that Caesarea we've seen before. And then the map is a little funky here. Then they go from Caesarea up to to Antioch, back to Antioch, okay? They, I know they, the, the map here has it going from Jerusalem, but that's not accurate. That's, from, that's a mix from the third journey. All right, so they would have left from Caesarea and then gone back up to Antioch. Notice it says on the text, it says we went down to Antioch. But on the map, look, he goes up. Wait a minute. Well, remember, they're not looking at maps here. Anytime you go away from their area of Judea, you're going down. When you go toward Judea in the hill country, you're going up. And even if it doesn't always, even if they're going up and down, for them, that's just the way they talk. Because when you, if you've ever driven to Judea or gone up into Jerusalem, you know that there's this trek up into the mountains. All right. So then look what it says there. And now you can pull up, uh, Andy, the third map. Look at your notes while Andy's pointing that up. I'm sorry, your Bible. Acts 18, verse 23. Read this, then we're going to look at that map there. After spending some time there in Antioch, he departed again. This is another journey. This is his third journey. Through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Strengthening all the disciples. Verse 24, and then it goes on. So look at the map there. Some commentators, a minority, uh, would suggest it because he says Galatia and Phrygia. So he must have gone north, which is Galatia is a little more north of that area. So he must have gone through Galatia and Phrygia. He, he must have skipped these, these ones. No, no, it doesn't make any sense. The majority of commentators uh, point out that, look, we're not talking a, a period when you have clear borders and things like that. If I asked you where are the borders of your county, would you be able to tell me? You might know where it is on a road when you cross it. It says you're crossing a state line or a county line. But if I asked you to look on a map without any markers and I wanted you to lay out for me where are your county lines or your state lines, you wouldn't be able to do it very accurately. You would refer to regions according to the most important area or a dominant name, an important name for, the, for that. And so most commentators conclude, and I agree with them, that as we, especially as we look at the details here, that what Paul does on his third journey is not pass north way up into Galatia, but into the southern region of Galatia, which was also border town Laconia. You see that? All right, so what that means then is Paul goes through it from Antioch, and now, again, we don't know for sure, but he probably saw Mom in Tarsus, but then he heads through Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, and then eventually to Ephesus. Okay, and maps will be a little varying here, and the reason is I want you guys to look at what it says in Acts. It says they passed through Galatia and Phrygia. It doesn't tell us where he went. It just tells us the next spot it tells us he, he is is in Ephesus in chapter 19, verse 1. 
So a lot of maps will just draw a line from Antioch to Ephesus and then kind of leave it to your imagination, you know, without getting too involved, which is fine. Uh, but we, it, we do have a detail here that helps us suggest where he would have gone. First of all, you know where he went on his first journey. You know where he went on his second journey. And so you could guess maybe that he would have gone the same region on his third day to check on the disciples. But look what it says, strengthening all of the disciples, verse 23. Strengthening all of the disciples. You get that same language again. If he's strengthening all the disciples, he must be going through the places where the disciples are, right? The church is. So, so you'll get a majority of maps or commentaries will tell you, look, he went from Antioch, hit Derbe, Iconium, uh, Lystra, Iconium, maybe Antioch, Pisidia, and then he headed over to Ephesus. It's almost, it would have been identical to his trek through Turkey uh, of his second journey. It would have made a lot of sense. Okay? With that in mind, then, I want you to look at that map, and I want you to recall for a second the first map. He founded churches in Iconium, Lystra, Derbe. He passed through those churches again to deliver to them the declaration, the council, don't be circumcised and kosher keeping the, the Gentiles when they come in. Then on his third journey, he wants to pass through the region and strengthen the brethren again. He stops at each one of these churches, as far as we can see, tell. And then he eventually ends in Ephesus, okay? And from Ephesus, he wrote a letter back to the churches of Galatia. And again, most commentators throughout history have identified the churches of Galatia, of what we see in the letter of the Galatians, as Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch and Pisidia probably as well. Those four churches, those four cities. Okay? So I want you to put your, put yourself in the place of Paul. Okay? He founded these churches. He even got stoned and almost killed a number of times doing it. Remember, church to church. Remember, fleeing, then going back. In fact, Andy, pull them up for us. Pull up map one. He founds those churches in Asia Minor. And after having founded those churches in Asia Minor and fleeing from city to city, as we saw in Acts, he then went back and visited them a second time, even on his first journey, to appoint elders, clergy in each one of them. Okay? Second time he visited them there, right? Now, Andy, pulled up the second map. Then, on his second journey, carrying with him the document from the council that said, don't circumcise and cause to keep kosher the Gentiles who want to come to Christ. Look what he went. He went and delivered, it said, to those churches, Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, and probably Antioch City. Now, third map, Andy. On his third journey, he goes through there again to check on them and strengthen the brethren. Again, probably Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, possibly Antioch of Pisidia, and eventually to Ephesus. When he's in Ephesus, he wrote two letters. The first one that he wrote, we're going to look at tonight, is called the letter to the Galatians. He wrote a letter from Ephesus back to those churches to deal with some problems that he saw while he was there. And that's the letter to the Galatians, plural. That is, the churches of Galatia. Okay? All right. Now, Let's take a look at the letter to the Galatians. In your New Testament, where are you going to find it? Well, where if, the letter to the Galatians, oh, those Pauline epistles. So, oh, where, where is this? So when you go to the Pauline epistles, it's actually fairly easy to find something. You don't need those little tabs that tear your papers anyway. If you look at the Pauline epistles, they're divided into two sections. The first section, which is much longer, is the community letters. And they're arranged from longest to shortest. Couldn't get any easier. Right? Then the second section of the Pauline epistles are his, the community letters. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the personal letters. So to Timothy, Titus, Philemon, things like that. So if you're looking for a personal letter of Paul to Timothy, you go to the end of the Pauline epistles. If you're looking for a community letter, you go to the, the first half. And then again, they're from longest to shortest. 
not in the order in which they were written. Why not? Because the New Testament was not intended to be put into a drawer of the Hilton or Best Western and have someone have a come to Jesus moment. That was not the purpose of any of this stuff. As you're going to see, the letter of the Galatians, as with the rest of the New Testament, were intended to be read in the midst of a Eucharistic gathering of a community in the early church in one of the cities in which they sent these letters or gospels to. That's exactly what we are still doing 2,000 years later. We gather together. We pray. We sing psalms. We hear the readings from the apostolic teachings. And then we break bread. We have the Eucharist. 2,000 years we've been doing this. Same exact thing. Certainly there's been development. But the development is like adding jewels onto an already beautiful, beautiful uh, image. Right? Where, where there's jewels and gold encrusted onto it as we continue to develop and add to our beautiful liturgy we receive. But you can peel away the layers all the way back to the apostolic period. All right. So Galatians, where do you find it? So if you go, your first letter you see is Romans. And then first and second Corinthians, and then Galatians. Probably the third letter, at least, that we have that Paul wrote. Or near to that number, somewhere around there. First and second Thessalonians, his first epistles, he wrote on his second journey. And then on his third journey, he wrote Galatians, first and second Corinthians, and Romans. This is in your introduction I gave you already in the notes. All right, so let's look at the letter to Galatians now. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Whoa, that's very different type of talking than you get in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, hi, Thessalonians, Paul, love you. Just wanted to say a few things. But... Galatians, Paul's pulled the six-shooter out and laid it on the table. What is, what's going on? First and Second Thessalonians, there is nothing like this. If you look at the, first, the beginning of First and Second Thessalonians, Paul, Silas, Timothy, right into you guys. Here we heard you got some questions. We want to answer them for you. We love you. See you again sometime soon. Galatians, very different. There's, there's a problem here in the community. There's a question about the authority of Paul and his nature of his apostleship. Why would they do that? We're going to see. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men. Right? This did not come by the hand of any man. I was chosen directly by Jesus Christ. Okay, see, there's, we're going to see why, this, why he has to say that. Who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, notice the plural, to the churches of Galatia, Lystra, Iconium, Derbe, Antipasidia, possibly. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank God always for you, Galatian Christians, for I remember you constantly in my pr Oh, that's not what it says. So there are two epistles of Paul where there's not a Thanksgiving section, which means he's not happy, okay? All the other epistles, he begins very nice. I thank God always for you in my prayers, remembering you when I was with you. Oh, I, I want to come see you next summer. And, and I, you're, he goes on and on. Just like you would do in a nice letter, right? A nice email, a, a formal email, formal letter. You don't just jump into the topic, right? A close friend, you might shoot a quick email off. But a for, think of a formal letter you might write to somebody. You begin with a little bit of general thing, information, and thank you for this, and thank you. And then he gets into the topic. There's not one of those in Galatians or 2 Corinthians. Paul was not happy in either of these epistles we're going to see. I am astonished. Not I'm, I give thanks. I am astonished. This is his astonished section, not his Thanksgiving section, that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. Underline grace there. In the grace of Christ, called you in the grace of Christ 
and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you, present tense. There are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Mm. Now, you've got to know Acts like the back of your hand. Okay, I want you to hold your hand there and flip for a second right back to Acts 15. Acts 15. I want to remind you what happened in Antioch when Paul got home after his second journey. I mean, after his first journey, remember this? He went back to Antioch to see the brethren. And then Acts 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension with them. So they went to Jerusalem. Right? Now, look what, look what the letter says that they sent. Chapter 15, verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and elders to send them a letter. And here's what the letter says. Verse 23. Brethren, both the apostles and the elders to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Colicate, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons from us have troubled you. Look at the word trouble there. You see that? Have troubled you from us. Have troubled you with words unsettling your minds. Although we gave them no instructions, it seemed good to us in the cylinder to choose men. So Barnabas, and they're, they're going to clarify this issue for you. No circumcision, no kosher laws. Forget that stuff. You see that? The troubling? There's been Christians who have come from Judea who showed up in Antioch, which is a Gentile city uh, church now, and are teaching them, you got to be, unless you are serving as you kosher, you cannot be saved. But we're all baptized. Yeah, baptism, of course, it's very important, but you got to be serving as you keep kosher, otherwise you can't be saved. And they were troubling them. You hear that letter in the letter? That since we have heard that some men have troubled you, they've come from us, well, we didn't tell them to do this. That's what's going on here. Watch this. It says, this is back to Galatians now. Back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who, underline, trouble you. Hear that language? And want to pervert the gospel. Because they want to change it. And we're going to find, what do they mean change it? They want to add to it. They're going to add to the gospel. The gospel that was preached was you must be baptized into Jesus to be saved. But they were adding, as Paul's going to say, something to that, as we saw in Acts 15. They were adding to it circumcision and kosher laws. The law of Moses is they would keep it in, in a city of like Derbe and Lystra. You couldn't add to it, you know, all the laws of sacrifice of Leviticus that you keep them in Jerusalem. Look at verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be anathema. You can remind that to your Mormon friends. Verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again. So as I have said before, so he's visited these people, right? He founded these churches. He visited them. He, he went through them twice on his first journey. He delivered them the declaration of the council on the second journey. And now he's gone through again on the third journey. Now I say again, 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 if anyone is preaching, present tense, to you a gospel, contrary to that which you receive, let him be anathema accursed what's the problem as you read the rest of the epistle there are christians who have moved into the pauline churches in galatia and are troubling them where they come from outer space pull up that map again for us there andy journey three where could these christians have come from as we're going to see what they're teaching is that the gentiles need to be circumcised and keep kosher Hmm, I wonder where they would have come from. Look at this map here. Where is Antioch? Antioch is north. This is over on the far right. Antioch of Syria is north of Palestine. Palestine is down there in the bottom right corner, Jerusalem, Judea, right? Caesarea is, you know, one of the beach towns. Okay, so remember the apostles and the, all the clergy had gathered in Jerusalem and had declared 
that those Christians, Jewish Christians who had left Jerusalem, they had the Antioch and troubled the church in the Antioch, were not welcome. They had not been sent by them, and they were troubling the Christians in Antioch and were saying that they had come from Jerusalem with the authority of the apostles, but they, didn't have, they weren't sent by them. Now, where do you think when Paul comes back with, with Barnabas, John Mark, Silas, Judas, these other guys, they come back to Antioch from Jerusalem, from the council, where do you think these Jewish Christians, the Judaizer Christians, the circumcision party would go? They can't go back to Jerusalem. Not welcome there. So they head north from Antioch. And exactly this, following the roads that Paul would have followed, the Roman roads, and they hit the churches. They go to each city as they're going along, and they start to show up in Antioch, of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Easy evangelization for them, right? There's already a church there. Hey, we can't go back to Jerusalem. Where should we go, Yaakov? I don't know, Abraham. Let's go up north. I know Paul was up there. So they go up and they visit the communities up in the north. And they bring with them the heresy, the Judaizer heresy, that they'd already infected the church in Antioch with. All right. So then, that's very important to understand how the, these false apostles, as Paul will call them in other places, have used the authority of Jerusalem, the name of Peter, the name of John, the name of James, Bishop Jerusalem, as their backing. We, were, we studied under Peter. Hey, I, I was baptized by John. And then they're coming to Antioch and trying to use that resume to argue for the Judaizer heresy. When they're kicked out of Antioch by Paul, when he gets there, the only place they can go is north. So then they eventually show up in his churches there and start infecting them with the same heresy. So look at Galatians, what it says now. He says in chapter 1, verse 10, Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant, a slave of Christ. So there's a hint, we're going to see at the end of the epistle, of one of Paul's suggestions of why they're doing this. He said, why would these Judaizers, what's motivating them? What's motivating them for this heresy? Well, what's motivating them is they want to make sure that they are a Jewish Christian converting Gentiles. Imagine this. You're a Jewish Christian. You're converting Gentiles to what they all understood still to be Judaism, which has been fulfilled, which accepts Jesus as the Messiah. Now, what if you want to still be accepted in your family and in your community and at the local synagogue? Well, you better make sure that these Gentiles you're bringing into your form of Judaism, this Christian faith, looks a lot like and what would be acceptable to Jews. So they're having Gentile Christians be circumcised, keep kosher, not only because they thought that it would require their salvation, but also so that they themselves won't be persecuted by their fellow Jews who are not Christian. Okay? Very important to see that. And this is a good spot to take our break. All right, so it looks like we're all coming back here. Now, let's take a look. Let's pick up where we left off there. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not a man's gospel. Remember that word man up in the first, from the first verse? So the argument he's going to make here, you're going to see this. I want to give it to you a little ahead of time so you understand where he's going so you can follow him. These Judaizers, these false apostles, these guys who have been sent out from Jerusalem that were not sent by Peter and John and James, as Peter said, and as the letter says there from Acts, but are claiming authority from them, they are claiming things like, I grew up with Peter. Hey, man, I played soccer with James when I was a kid, all right? I was baptized by John the, 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 the Beloved. I studied at the feet of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. Paul? Who? Paul? Oh, Paul. What did Paul tell you? He didn't tell you you need to be circumcised? Paul. 
Do you know where Paul's from? Paul's one of your neighbors. He's from Tarsus. He's not even, he wasn't, he doesn't know the apostles in Jerusalem. He doesn't, he doesn't know what we believe, that the mother church there. He's, he's a, he's from Tarsus. Come on. Remember Tarsus? It's right there in Asia Minor. How could he know what we know who were trained under the pillars of the church in Jerusalem? Listen to us. Okay. Avraham, go get a knife. All right. Now, um, okay, so they're going to, they want them to be circumcised and keep kosher. All right. Now, with that in mind, look what he says here. Verse 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not a man's gospel. Right? I didn't receive it from man. I wasn't told it by a man. Remember up in verse 1? I am an apostle. I was sent. Apostolos means sent. Not from men, this is chapter 1, verse 1, nor through man, but from Jesus Christ. Jesus sent him. You remember that? Remember the conversion? Paul, as you'll say here and elsewhere, he's an apostle, a real apostle, sent really by Jesus, just like any of the others. But, as he said, the least among them, because I persecuted the church. And he, he came uh, as a, a, a late-born baby, he says. But he, he's one of them. One of, the, one of the apostles, no different from them. Does that mean he doesn't see Peter and James and John Jerusalem as having special uh, authority? And No. A, but what he's doing is he's taking the argument that these uh, false apostles are making, these Judaizers are making. There's no, there are no fax machines. There are no emails, no text messaging. You can't pick up a phone. I got an, uh, an email one time from somebody who wanted to come, a priest was visiting the area. He wanted to come and celebrate liturgy at our church with me. He was going to be there that Sunday. I didn't know who he was. Well, so what did I do? I, I took the email he'd sent me and I forwarded it to the bishop. I said, who's this guy? Do you know who he is? He emailed back. Oh, yeah, he's fine. I know him. Oh, okay. And I sent an email to the priest. You're welcome. You're welcome to come. But I'm not going to just let some, walk, you know, some guy walk into the church and say, hey, I'm a priest from, uh, so, you know, whatever city or whatever, and um, I'm uh, here, and I'd like to celebrate liturgy. Who knows the guy? Who knows who he could be? So there's no way to check out the information and for Paul to prove to the churches of Galatia that these guys are lying. It's his word against theirs. And who knows how many there are, maybe 5, 10, 20 of them. To spread out a network of them in these churches now, governing the churches and running them. And Paul shows up, and the churches are being influenced and run by these new individuals that Paul probably recognized a few of them from Antioch who had come from Jerusalem, right? The whole thing. So it, that may be the reason why in Acts it just says Paul went from Antioch through Galatia to Ephesus. It must. Have, it probably was a very quick trip. He probably went church hopping through there and just moved on trying to figure out what to do. Maybe he had a little dispute with each of them as he went and then just moved on and then decided to write this letter back. Because in a letter, he can lay out the argument nice and clear, and this will go to each one of the churches and will have a lasting effect. A lot better than sitting there arguing with them face-to-face -face in front of the congregation. All right, so then. He says in chapter 1, verse 11, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which I preach is not a man's gospel, for I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it. Right? That's what they're claiming. They were taught by Peter, James, and John. He says, okay, fine, I'll assume their argument. They're heretics, but I'll just, let's just leave that. Let's assume that argument. They were taught by Peter, James, and John. Okay. I was taught by Jesus. All right, so I outrank them. I outrank these false apostles who are claiming authority from Jerusalem. I'm not at their level. I'm one tier up. I'm at the tier of Peter, James, and John, he says. He says, for I did not receive it from men, nor was I taught it, but it was through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You know the story. For you have heard from my former life in Judaism. Now he gives his CV. He's got to show them that he is an authentic Jewish Christian who really knows his stuff. I persecuted the church in Judea. Uh, you heard my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my own age, beyond my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. So I knew all that stuff. I was a Pharisee. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, 
and had called me through his grace. What's he doing? That's Jeremiah, right? He showed himself to be like a new Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah was not liked by a lot of the his local priests and clergy at his time. He's like Jeremiah. And called me through his grace. Notice, called me through his grace, as they were called here, see? was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the highlight Gentiles. That's his mission. Paul sees his mission as preaching to the Gentiles. He goes from church city to city, goes to a synagogue on the Sabbath, finds the Jews, preaches the gospel. Now there's a seed. And then he leaves the city and lets that church grow as the Gentiles start to flow in. But he sees his job in each one of these. He's going in Gentile regions. This is for the Gentiles. So highlight the word Gentiles there. Now, as you're highlighting here, you might want to highlight. I use pink for this because it's the color of flesh. You're going to see the whole epistle turns pink in a second. Watch this. I did not confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me to confer with flesh and blood. That's an Aramaic way of speaking. To human, I didn't check with any, any human being, which is what these guys are claiming they did, right? And he's showing himself to be one level above them, right? I didn't have to go do that. I'd already heard it from Jesus. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem. Why does he say that? Because this is what they're claiming they did, right? Nor did I go up to Jerusalem. This is when he was in Damascus. Remember the whole on the road to Damascus? He says, but rather... I went into Arabia again and then returned to Damascus. So we hear a little bit more information. When Paul had his vision and then was blinded, he went to Damascus. Scales fell from his eyes. He was baptized, as we hear in Acts. And then the next thing Acts says, he's preaching the gospel in Damascus. Wow, it's kind of fast. Well, Paul tells us a little bit more information here. He went off into Arabia, which in that time would mean he went off into the desert. He headed east to go on a little Mary of Egypt retreat, right? He headed off in the wilderness. And then he came back to Damascus, and now we pick up an Acts where he's preaching in the synagogue there. Okay, so it says, verse 18, then after three years, now three in the Bible, you know three means complete, right? So he doesn't just tell them a few years. He wants to say three, which means it was a while, okay? After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Kepha. And Remained with him 15 days. Mm -hmm. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, if you read in Acts, you remember after a while, Paul does eventually go to Jerusalem. This is before his first journey. Okay, this is before his first journey. This is simply that persecution journey. He went north, and then he's off at Tarsus. He goes to Antioch for all these things. This is before he goes off on his first journey. He did go to Jerusalem, as it says in Acts, eventually. But he's trying to show that he wasn't feeling urgent to go to Jerusalem because he didn't need to. You see the point? What he's trying to make, the argument? These false apostles are claiming that their authority comes directly from Jerusalem. They were sent by the Paul says, I outrank them. On, on their very arguments they're making, I outrank them. And then he says, verse 18, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Kepha, that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. Yeah, we were hanging out. And I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. That's James, Bishop of Jerusalem. In what I am writing you before God, I do not lie. Why would he have to say that? Well, he's taking an oath. That is something that these false apostles are claiming to the contrary, that Paul's never been to Jerusalem. Paul says, I went there after some time. I didn't feel a need, but I went there eventually. And I went and I saw Kepha. We hung out 15 days. And then James, Bishop of Jerusalem, yeah, we, I know him. We were hanging out. And he takes an oath. I swear to God this is true. That now is evidence for the churches of Galatia that Paul went to Jerusalem. There's no way he would say something like that unless he really went. Okay? So then he says, then I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, right? He went north. Now, this is his first journey. I went into Syria. So he goes from, from Jerusalem to Antioch. From Antioch, he, he heads, of course, up into eventually that region. He doesn't mention Cyprus because it's not needed for the, the subject here. He wants to get to Cilicia and Galatia and talk about the stuff. He says, verse 22, I was still not known by sight to the churches of Christ in Judea, 
Yeah, most people don't, they don't know me. Yeah. They only heard it and said, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorify God because of me. So if these Judaizer Christians are saying that we don't know Paul, we were in the church in Jerusalem for years, we never saw him. Paul says, yeah, that's because I made one little quick trip there, hung out with Peter and, and uh, James, and I got out of there. And then I spent my time up in the churches of, of, of Turkey and Asia Minor preaching the gospel, right? So then he says, chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. This is probably that trip to Jerusalem at which they had the council. Although there's, it's hard to pin all this stuff down because Paul's talking about different things here. But it seemed that this is his trip to Jerusalem now, that second trip, when he goes and they have the council. And you, it, there's a number of details that seem to support that, as you're going to see here now. He says, at 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. So he had Barnabas with him. When did he go to Bar Jerusalem with Barnabas? That was for the council. For the council, he would have had Barnabas still with him. Taking Titus along with me as well. Now, Titus? Okay, Barnabas, that is an Aramaic name, right? Son of comfort. But Titus, that's a Greek name. Taking Titus along with me. Why does he throw Titus in there? We didn't hear about him in Acts. Because Paul wants to make a point. Titus, that's a Greek name. Mm -hmm. I went up by revelation. I laid before them, but privately, before those who were of repute, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Highlight Gentiles there in pink, right? You're going to see why. The gospel I preach. So he went up to Jerusalem and he presented to those who were reputed, Peter and James. Others, Look, this is what I've been doing in Jerusalem, but there's people that are arguing with me now in Antioch. And they said they were sent by you guys. So he says, lest somehow I should be running or had run in vain. So just want to check the sources. Just make sure there's people arguing with me now saying that I'm not preaching the true gospel. So I went after a while to Jerusalem and I checked with the authorities there. Just to be sure. Just to be sure. Okay. This is Acts 15. So he says, chapter 2, verse 3. Even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be highlight pink circumcised. So that means Titus was a Gentile, right? Or a uncircum some uncircumcised of some sort. He was a convert. Paul took along with him a sample of what he's been doing. So he goes through some, and he, and he says, even Titus was not compelled to be served, though he was a Greek, non-Jew. Why does Paul say that right there? Now, you, I ask that question, you say, obviously, this is all about what was going on in Acts 15. But I say, I, I stop right here, I want you to think about this. The average person reading Galatians does not know everything that we've talked about up to this point. So they get to this point, and that line is like a strange tangent out in the middle of nowhere. Circumcision? What's Paul talking about circumcision all of a sudden for? Because most people don't know the historical background of the Pauline Epistle, especially Galatians. Mainly due to Luther. All right. More on that in a second. But because of false brethren, in other places Paul's going to refer to false apostles, false brethren. So imitation Christians, not real ones secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom. Remember, in Acts 15, it says there were Pharisees there. Remember that? Who secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, our freedom, which we have in Christ. I'm going in 300 times. We talked about that before. We'll talk about it again. In Christ, that means to be baptized into him, to be in him that they might bring us into bondage. So notice he's in freedom, but they want to bring us into bondage. This is what Peter says in Acts 15, right? The, the, the Torah, trying to lay the Torah upon the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, circumcision, kosher, it's a yoke you can't bear. Other places, Paul referred to the Torah like this. Again, a thing that binds you. He says that they wanted to bring us into bondage, but look at verse 5. To them we did not yield submission even for a moment that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for 
you, underline you 300 times in, in pink, okay? Who's you? The Galatian Christians. What's the issue? Whether or not they need to be circumcised to keep kosher. See what's going on here? He says, and from those who were reputed to be something, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. <laughs> Look at that. Right? Paul is not saying Peter, James, and John, the, the, the clergy of Jerusalem have absolutely no relevance to him. Why in the world did he go there then? Obviously, he sees them as having some authority and important. But what he's doing is he's taking the argument right out from underneath these false apostles in, Jer in Galatia who are claiming the authority from those guys. Right? He says, God shows no partiality. No partiality. Do you remember that? No partiality. That's from Acts, the council. Right? That's what Peter said. So if you make a little note for yourself there, God shows no partiality. Make a note for yourself. Put Acts 10.34. That's what Peter said in the house of Cornelius. What was the deal in the house of Cornelius? Jew versus Gentile, circumcision, kosher laws versus not, right? And then also Peter said the same thing, very similar. God showed no difference between uh, making no difference. At the council, he said this. This was in Acts 15.9, 15.9, okay? God shows no partiality. He quotes from the, dec the declaration that they all received from him on his second journey. Those I say who are reputed added nothing, added nothing. See the word added there? That's the way the gospel is being corrupted. They're not taking you know, something away from the gospel. They're adding something to it. They're adding circumcision because you must be saved. We're baptized. Yeah, I know, but you've, you, gotta, you also keep kosher. Remember that in Acts 15. You must be circumcised, get the law of Moses to be saved, he says. They were saying this to baptize Gentiles. So they're adding to the gospel. You see how it works? And again, if you wonder what he means by adding, look at this. But on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the highlight pink uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel highlight pink to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for the mission to the highlight circumcised worked through me also for the highlight Gentiles, uncircumcised. I wonder what this epistle is all about. Hmm. But you know what, even though we're, for you it's quite obvious, it screams what this is all about. The average person today listening to this epistle, the average Baptist reading this epistle under Lutheran influence, certain of course laws is just not even on the radar screen. For them, it's, it's all what you believe versus what you do. It's works versus faith. Works versus faith. Oh, yeah, I've heard that stuff before. Notice that you don't see that here. All right, so. Verse 9, and when they perceived the grace that was given to me by James, me, James, Bishop of Jerusalem, Kepha, that is Peter, and John, that's the evangelist there, John the Apostle, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the highlight Gentiles, and they highlight circumcised. Only they would have us remember the poor, which very thing I was here to do. What does that mean? Remember the poor. So you guys go off to the churches. You go evangelize the Gentiles. We're going to stay here and evangelize the Jews. Circumcised, right? But don't forget us, the poor. Remember, Paul's got to keep bringing stuff back to the churches that are persecuted in Judea. So you go out and do your business out there. But remember to send some cash once in a while when you help. All right. Verse 11. But when Kepha came to Antioch, so this is after the council, Paul went up there, delivered the declaration to council. Then, look what it says, I opposed him to his face because he was wrong. He stood condemned, katagenosko, to be contrary to knowledge. Condemned, stood condemned. It's courtroom language, but condemned in modern English sounds a little harsh. He stood condemned. He was shown to be wrong. For before certain men came from James, that is from Jerusalem, he ate with Gentiles. Ate. Look at the issue. We're not talking about just circumcision. Ate. He ate with Gentiles. He was eating bacon. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Remember those guys who were harassing him earlier, right? So when Paul goes up to, to deliver the declaration of the council, and then we learn something else here, that Peter eventually went up there too. And Peter's hanging out with Paul. They're eating bacon, cheese on the burger, having fun with the Gentiles. Suddenly, a group of Jewish Christians arrives from Jerusalem, and Peter stops eating bacon, right? 
at the restaurant. Excuse me, yes, I'll have a burger, please, kosher. No cheese. No bacon. No, 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 no. But Peter, you always eat bacon. No, no. Abraham, so how is uh, James doing in Jerusalem? And what do you think the Gentile Christians are going to think about this? Now, remember, Christians back then, as we still do in some of our churches, the Eastern churches were pretty serious about this still, and uh, I, I'd like to see this more in the Western churches as well. It's kind of fallen out of use. But having a meal together after the liturgy. After the liturgy, you gather in the hall, and you hang out for an hour or two, and you eat. Coffee and donuts works, but usually people eventually want to go get something substantial. But the point is, in the early church, they did this. They would get together. Remember, you never got together to have a meal. So they'd get together. They would hear the gospel. They would break bread and Eucharist, and then they would hang out for hours talking and eating. Well, what are they going to eat? Right? What are you going to eat when you walk up to the table there? Whose table are you going to sit at in the hall? So Peter looks like it means something to him whether or not you're circumcised or keep kosher. And so Paul takes him to task with this. Look what it says. He says, and with him the rest of the Jews, Jewish Christians, acted insincerely. So even Barnabas was carried away by their insincerity. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Kepha, before them all, if you, a Jew, live like a Gentile, right? You live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Right? If you're a Jewish Christian, you see Peter suddenly not eating bacon anymore, then maybe uh, as a Gentile Christian, you start to th feel inadequate. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Maybe I should keep kosher. Look what Peter's doing. He says, verse 15, we ourselves who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, it means this is not previous to baptism, we are Jews by birth and our origin, not Gentile pagans in origin. He says, but we ourselves know that a man is not justified, that is saved, made righteous before God by the works of the Torah. Now, see the word law there? I want you to underline it 300 times, right in the little side there, Torah. The law in the Old Testament, Torah, the Torah, the Hebrew word, is translated to Greek in the Septuagint with nomos, law. And that's why when you go to the Old Testament, you look up the word law in your concordance, you'll see, you'll see law in the Old Testament places, the law given by Moses, it's the Torah in the Hebrew. So just put Torah there, and suddenly it makes sense to you. The works of the Torah. What are the works of the Torah that you could observe in Antioch? Circumcision and no bacon, all right? Kosher laws. He says, a man's not justified by works of the Torah, but through faith in Jesus Christ. It's Jesus that's going to save you, not circumcision. Once you're baptized into Christ, once you're in Christ, then you don't need to be circumcised and kosher. That's not going to save you. Jesus is going to save you. See how that works? We, we put our trust in Jesus, not in, the, in Moses and the law. Even we who have believed in Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the Torah, because by the works of the Torah shall no one be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we ourselves were found to be sinners as Christ, then we say, no, certainly not. But if I build up again those things which I tore down, then I prove myself a transgressor. Right? Ah, you want me to go start, you, Peter, and I, we're going to go start teaching people to be circumcised keep kosher now? After we've been eating bacon? Peter? Certainly not. But if I, he says, for I, through the Torah, died to the Torah. What does he mean, died to the Torah? Died to the Torah. Put Romans 6 there. There's tons of places where you see this. Paul is clearly talking about his baptism. Paul will refer to himself having died to the Torah, having died with Christ. It's Romans 6, in his baptism into Christ. For I, through the Torah, died to the Torah, that I might live to God. That's Romans 6 in a nutshell. The whole chapter is one little verse in Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. Romans 6 again. When was Paul crucified? He says, by his baptism into Christ. I have been crucified with Christ in my baptism, right? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is You see this in Romans 6, exactly. I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification, right, to be made righteous, were through the Torah, then Christ died to no purpose. Now again, Romans 6, Romans 6, Romans 6. Paul 
has catechized these Christians. These guys, there are, there are no Christians that know Pauline theology better than these guys. So Paul's saying like little references, like being having died to Christ, being crucified to Christ, and he expects they know what he's talking about. Thank God we have the letter of the Romans. The letter of the Romans was written to a community that had not been evangelized by Paul. So what Paul can say in six little chapters, in very quick little statements, to the Romans he has to do in 16 chapters. One liner in Galatians is a whole chapter in the letter of the Romans where Paul has to explain in detail, which is why probably the early church read Romans at the beginning of the lectionary of the Pauline epistles. So that if you read that, you could figure out what he's saying in his other epistles, which is much more cryptic if you are not his audience in Galatia that already knows Pauline theology. See how that works? Okay. Chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Right? He preached the gospel of Jesus, having died and risen from the dead. Let me ask you this only once. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the Torah? Or by hearing with faith. Obviously, it was by hearing, right? They heard the gospel, and they were baptized in Jesus. Are you so foolish, having begun with the Spirit, which they were given in their baptism, right? Are you now ending with the flesh, right? Circumcision and what you do, what you eat or don't eat? Did you experience so many things in vain, if it really is in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the Torah? Or by hearing with faith. The church is spread there by the preaching of the gospel, not by the preaching of a, a circumcision knife. Verse 6. Thus Abraham believed God and it was reckoned him as righteousness. That little line there is a whole chapter in Romans. That's Romans chapter 4. Right? He can say something like, thus Abraham was, you know, Galatians, which I explained to you 3,000 times when I was there. What do you mean, thus, Abraham? Paul, what do you mean, thus? Right? So Romans 4, Paul has to explain what he means, thus, because these guys have never heard his stuff before. What does he mean? Look, Abraham was called justified by God in chapter 15 of Genesis. He wasn't circumcised till decades later in chapter 17. And the kosher laws didn't come till Moses 400 years later. So there's no way Abraham was made righteous by circumcision and kosher laws. So he says, you Galatians are like Abraham, who were justified by hearing with faith, not by circumcision or kosher laws. All right. Uh, there's a lot more here. We can't look at all the details. I want you to look at chapter 3, verse 23. Now, before faith came, we were confined under the Torah, kept under restraint until faith should be revealed, so that the Torah was our custodian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith not by circumcision potions. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian, for in Christ, the word in, in Christ, Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. How did you get in Christ? Well, you had to get into him to be in him, right? But here's the next line. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have Put on Christ like a garment. Now you're in Christ. How? Through baptism. So when you hear Paul talking about being in Christ, he means uh, due to your baptism into him. He says this a number of other places too. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, nor all, all are one in Christ. Look at the word in there. And if you are Christ's, that's part of his body, then you are Abraham's offspring, Genesis 12, 3. Heirs according to the promise. How? Because you're a member of the body of Christ. Real, like for real. And if Christ inherited resurrection and glorification, what do you think you will inherit by being in Christ? So therefore, what do you need to be served as a kosher for? All right, so then chapter 4, look at 10. They're not just being served as a kosher. Chapter 4, verse 10. You observe days, months, seasons, years. I'm afraid I labor out beyond vain. Right? They're keeping the Sabbath. They're, you know, keeping the Feast of Tabernacles as best as they can there. They're keeping having little Passover Seder meals and stuff like that. What? They're Judaizers. Chapter 5. For freedom, Christ has set us 
free. Look at that word freedom. Remember freedom? Freedom, we heard that before. Free. Stand fast, therefore, right? Be firm. And do not submit again, right? They did it once. He's telling them, you better not do this again after you receive this letter from me. Do not submit yourselves, right? Don't put yourself under something again to a yoke of slavery. Put a little line, note there for yourself. Acts 15, right? I'll give you the exact verse too. Acts 15, verse 10. That's Peter's words. That's how Peter described trying to put kosher laws and circumcision upon the Gentiles is like putting a yoke upon them that we, neither we nor they could bear. No way. Now, if you wondered what he meant, look at chapter 5, verse 2. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 2. Now, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive, highlight, circumcision, pink, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man. Again, so he's, he said this a number of times, these guys. That's why there's no Thanksgiving section. I say again to every man who receives, highlight, circumcision, that he is bound to keep the whole Torah. Right? If you think you're going to be justified, by the Torah, then circumcision kosher laws aren't going to save you. You've got to do it all, all 365 laws. You are severed from Christ. He's using circumcision language here, right? In being circumcised in the flesh after your baptism and trusting in, in circumcision kosher laws, it's like cutting yourself off from the body of Christ. Right? This is the image of the foreskin falling, falling right? You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the Torah. You have fallen away from grace, right? You've, you've, you've fallen. This is, again, that image of the, of the foreskin falling off the body. And serves it's very vivid stuff here. So you're going to see he gets even more vivid. You are severed from Christ, you have, who would be justified by the Torah. You would fall away from grace, for through the Spirit, right, which you receive in baptism, by faith, we wait for the hope of righteousness. What's the hope of righteousness? If you read Paul very carefully, go get a concordance, look up the word hope. Over and over again, every spot, you're going to see he's talking about future bodily resurrection, which is what this is all about. Being baptized into Christ, receiving his body and blood so we can be raised by him at the end. That's our future hope. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is the good news. And he says, so that's what's going to save you, being in Christ and remaining faithful to him. Not Circumcision and kosher laws. Verse 6, for in Christ, look at the word in there, being in Christ, being a member of the body of Christ, being a part of the church, having already been baptized, being in Christ, that's stative, right? Into is directional, right? Your baptism is into. You are now in a state of being in Christ by virtue of baptism. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision highlight nor highlight uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love as he says in so many places, right? Once you're baptized in Christ, you walk according to the Spirit, which is in you, the Spirit of Jesus. Now you walk according to Jesus' works. You help the poor, you help the needy, you help the downtrodden, you preach the good news to those who need it. That's our calling as Christians. Walk in the ways as Jesus walked when he was on this earth. Look what he says in verse 12. <laughs> I like this, verse 12. I wish those who would unsettle you, there's that word, who trouble you, would mutilate themselves. So put a little a note there for yourself. Unsettle would trouble you. Put that note there again. That's back to or in chapter 15, right? So who would trouble you? All right. So then this is what circumcision is. Hold on. Just one little note. I know some of you think, but circumcision, how many Christians in America are circumcised? Something else. That has to do with American medical practice imitating Jewish medical practice in England, okay? And there's debate among doctors whether or not it's a, it has any biological benefit. In fact, the arguments are starting to sway the other way again. All Christians outside of England and the United States and countries that have, are connected, you know, English-speaking countries, you know, Italy, Philippines, Mexico, they don't circumcise Christians. It started doing American medical practices for an influence states recently, but you go back 100 years ago, Christians weren't circumcised. Modern circumcision in the hospitals is a medical debate, biological thing, nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Okay? All right. Look at verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Look at that word freedom again. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So let me clarify. But through love, be servants of one another. For the whole Torah is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your brethren, your neighbor as yourself. Right? 
And then he goes on, he says, don't give in to the flesh versus the spirit. Now, again, remember, don't think of Paul as a pagan dualist. We're going to talk about that later on, pagan dualism. Paul will often talk about walking according to the spirit versus according to the flesh. What he means is, you who have been baptized into Christ have died and been raised with him spiritually. You're still awaiting a physical resurrection. And so now you are a composite being. You need to walk according to the spirit of Jesus, the resurrected being, the new creation, and let your spirit guide your flesh, which is still awaiting sanctification and resurrection. All right, this is the process we call theosis or sanctification, living a life in which your body is governed by your spirit, not as the world often does out there, your psyche, your spirit, everything being governed by what your body wills. So even a Christian, he says, Christians, you are now baptized. Don't walk according to the flesh, your desires, your flesh, the old man, but walk according to the new man, and then you will also have bodily resurrection, and then there will be perfect cohesion between your spirit and your body and will. So he says, no immorality, no impurity, no licentiousness, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll end here. Look what it says in chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 11. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. So this is his testimony. That this is his letter, right? This is not a fake. This is his words here. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that would compel you to be circumcised. Flesh, pink, circumcised, pink, right? He tells the Galatian Christians the reason why these Judaizers are making them do what they're doing. Only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ by their fellow Jews, right? For even those who receive circumcision, highlight, do not themselves keep the Torah. It's all a show. They desire to have you highlight circumcised that they may glory in your flesh, right? They can say to their Jewish brethren at the synagogue, hey, we're making headway with the Gentiles. Want to join up? But far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Baptism, baptism, baptism. Paul glories in his baptism into Jesus, not circumcision. And again, you're, you're saying, why didn't he say baptism there? Paul's preaching a community that he founded and catechized and catechized and catechized on, on this very topic. So you've got to go back and read Romans and Colossians. Romans and Colossians will be very good for you this week in your homework to, to read. I'll give you that assignment one second here. It's in the epistle. Verse 15, for neither highlight circumcision counts for anything, nor highlight uncircumcision, but a new creation. That's Romans 8. Paul says you are a new creation by virtue of baptism into Christ. Peace and mercy upon all who walk by this rule, this law upon the Israel of God. For Paul, the church baptized Christians, whether circumcised or uncircumcised, are the true Israel. The true Israel. And this is why there should never be such a thing as Christian Zionism. It's a modern, crazy idea that is totally contrary to what Paul taught. We are Israel. We are Israel, and if you doubt that, you're doubting your baptism into Jesus Christ. And you're, you're saying that someone who is genetically a descendant of Abraham or is circumcised to keep kosher is the true Israel, which is contrary to what you read all over the New Testament. Verse 17, henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, right? not the marks of Moses. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Let's take some questions now, Andy. Yeah, thank you so much, Father. We've got a couple queued up already in the uh, box here. Got a question from Bob. He is saying, okay, in Galatians 4, chapter 4, verse 10, this observing of days, months, seasons, years, sounds like the Jewish feastal cycle. Uh, but don't we still have a feastal cycle in our liturgy today? So. What's the difference? Why is that one? Oh, yeah. Is he saying so, that one's bad? And It's a great question. The festival cycle of Israel. We have feast days that do correspond to certain feast days of ancient Judaism. But it's not because they correspond to ancient Judaism or that we're fulfilling ancient Judaism's feast, but, oh, well, they do it, so we're going to do it. No, no, no. That's called Judaizing. Seventh-day Adventists do that today. Messianic Jews, which are neither Messianic nor Jews, but it's for another 
discussion. They do those things. It's, it, those are the Judaizer heresies. Okay, those churches, Seventh Day Adventists, Seventh Day Baptists, uh, and Messianic Jews uh, play around with the Judaizer heresy today. You still see that stuff. And they get deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And they start doing stuff like this, keeping, uh, they have Seder meal at their house for Passover and stuff, completely forgetting that the feast of Easter, Pascha, is the Passover in the church. So, but why do we celebrate feast days that correspond sometimes? So, because this, these are, we celebrate, ancient Israel celebrated in a festal cycle, major important historical salvific events in their history. And they did it yearly to remember the so Passover every year to remind them how God brought them out of Egypt. And while he passed over the houses, their houses and he killed the Egyptians and they got out. Every year they'd celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, which reminded them how God gave them the law at Mount Sinai, so they didn't keep it. Every year they'd celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles to remind them how God caused them to dwell in tents and that God came to dwell in a tent among them. All right, while they're in the wilderness. So we celebrate feast days that sometimes correspond to those and sometimes they don't. Right? We have feast days in the church that have no part of the history of ancient Judaism. We celebrate the Feast of the Seven Ecumenical Councils. We might celebrate the, the, a feast of a, a particular era in the church or a particular event, the Council of Nicaea, things like that. But we celebrate feasts that correspond to the Jewish cycle where a, a Christian event took place for us that happened to correspond to that. Jesus, on the Feast of Passover, the Jews, Jesus died and rose from the dead. We, were, we passed from death to life. It was a new exodus for us out of the spiritual Egypt. We celebrate Pentecost each year, not because the Jews celebrate Pentecost, 50 days of Passover, but because on the day of the Feast of Pentecost among the Jews is when we receive the spirit within us that gives us Jesus within us, that is the word of God became flesh within us, not on stone tablets. It's the fulfillment of what happened at Sinai. So we, we remember, yes, we go back and remember what happened at Sinai to understand what happened at the Pentecost for the Christians in Acts. But what, every year we celebrate Pentecost, we're celebrating what happened in Acts 2 and what it means for us today and continues to mean. See how that works? For example, the Feast of Tabernacles. That was the greatest of the three feasts. We don't celebrate that. We have feasts that kind of hint to the fulfillment of that. The first and foremost important would be the Feast of, the, of Epiphany, the baptism of our Lord, Theophany, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, and there's certain tabernacles imagery there. Also the Feast of Transfiguration, you can, see, you can see some tabernacles imagery there. But we don't celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles on the day when the Jews celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. We don't go out and build huts on our roof and stuff like that in our backyard. You want, a, you want a hut? Go to the church. There it is. You are in the hut. You're a Christian. You're in the tabernacle. You are in the, you are in the house of God. So there is some correspondence, but notice that we do not celebrate Jewish feasts because of their Jewish feasts in the Old Testament. The Jews celebrated feasts in the first century. They were celebrating the festal cycle, which reminded them of major important salvific events in their history. We likewise celebrate our festal cycle a memory of and the continuation of its importance today, major salvific events that happened in our history. And yes, in the early stages, there was some parallelism there, even chronologically. Okay, so you don't want to go out and start eating gefilte fish unless you like it or matzo balls, okay, or get yourself a yam. Okay? This is where it all eventually leads to. I knew a, a Seventh-day Adventist, a very nice guy, who Roman Catholic who had left and become a Seventh-day Adventist over – typical confusions on this. And Andy uh, pointed out to you, we have a whole thing on the Sabbath keepers on the, on the, uh, in the library for you. And he, he left, uh, went, became a Sunday Adventist. And then as they all do, it never stops there. Starts keeping the Sabbath. Before you know it, he uh, is wearing a prayer shawl. And eventually, I don't know where he is now, what's happened to him, but all, very common among them is they start having Seder meals they start following the Jewish festival cycle. They start hanging out at the local synagogue. Hey, bro, I'm one of you. Now, Jews have been dealing with Christians for 2,000 years, and they have some very good apologetics. So then Brother Avraham hands him a tract. Ooh. And before you know it, apostasy. So the, what happens is, this is you slip back into it. The, the letter of the Hebrews is all about this. 
slipping back into the following of the Torah. Once you do it, you get far enough into it, then what, what do you need Jesus for? Okay. Thanks for helping uh, clarify that. I know I was seeing Bob right in here and that, that really helped him. Father, if we could receive a blessing from you and then we'll, we'll end there. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. 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 The blessing Lord is mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. 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 We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.